Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, my name's Cullum. I'm an engineer at Amazon Web Services. And I'm here uh, to talk about PID loops uh, and about how we use them to keep systems stable. And I actually have a subtitle for this talk, uh, which I went back and forth on whether I should give it or not, um, which is P PID loop, uh, PID loops, PID loops, are, they come from control theory. And um, this is maybe my fourth, third or fourth talk, different talk about control theory in the last year. And back in January, I did a, I did a workshop where we looked at control theory with a, a bunch of practitioners and academics who, who do formal verification of systems. And uh, the conclusion I've reached in that year is that control theory is just an unbelievably rich vein of knowledge and expertise and insight um, in, into how to control systems, how to keep systems stable, uh, which are very much part of like, what I do. You know, I work at Amazon Web Services, where we have all these cloud services, big distributed systems, uh, and keeping them live and running is obviously a very important task. And, and like really digging into control theory, like reading books about it, getting into the literature, talking to experts, it's like, like finding literally like 100 years of written down expertise that just all applied to my field that we seem not to know about. You know, the, ti the, the title for this whole track that we're doing here is about CS in the modern world. Uh, and I actually think it's, a, it's kind of a travesty that we don't teach control theory as part of computer science generally. It's commonly part of engineering and physics, and that's where I first learned it. Uh, I did physics in college. And um, it amazes me how much relevancy there is in there. And, and like it says here, the fruit is so low hanging. Like there are so many things to learn that it's touching the ground. We could just take these lessons away. In fact, I actually think you can spend just a week or two like reading about control theory, and you will be in the 99th percentile of all people in computer science who know anything about control theory. Um, and you will be like an instant expert, and it gives you superpowers, some of which I'm going to talk about, to, to really uh, get insights into, into how systems can be built better. Uh, it's, it's fascinating, and like nothing excites me more right now. But I'm going to start with something that's a little meta. Um, Back in uh, late last year at AWS's big conference uh, called reInvent, uh, I gave a talk, which was uh, um, one of a, a series of talks there too. We actually gave some kind of let's open the curtains talks about how we build things internally, how we design systems, how we analyze them. Uh, my colleague Peter Voschel gave one about how we think about blast radius, and I gave one about just how we control systems. Uh, and just a small bit in the middle, I was talking about this stuff, control theory because um, I didn't have time to go into too much detail. And uh, Cindy reached out after and contacted me and said, well, that material looks pretty interesting. Um, let's get some more on that. And, and here I am at QCon, right? And so like, I did something. I gave a talk, right? Somebody observed it, gave me feedback, and now I'm reacting and giving you that talk, right? Congratulations, that is like 99% of control theory. <laughs> It, like it applies to like almost everything in life, not just how we control stable systems and analyze them and make sure that they're safe, but like business processes too. Like I've seen it crop up in really strange places. You know, I was talking to a sales team, and they were telling me the first thing they do when they go into a new field area and they have to you know get leads and sell products and so on is they just start measuring. They should start measuring their success rate so that they can identify their wins and build on them and identify their losses and correct whatever they need to correct. Um, and it just fascinated me. They're basically taking a control theory uh, process to, to, to even like a, uh, a very high level task like how to sell things. It doesn't just apply to engineering things. So if you're not familiar with control theory, if you've never heard about it, uh, didn't even know it existed, um, like I said, it's about a 100-year-old field. It evolved uh, independently in several different branches of science. Uh, there's a few competing arguments as to where the first discoverers were. The chemists claim it was first discovered when analyzing chemical reactions. The, physics, the physicists claim it was first discovered when studying you know, thermodynamics. Uh, and engineers had been using it for mechanical control systems and so on. And eventually, all these different fields realized, hey, we, we have these same equations and same approaches uh, that it turn out are very general. They're about controlling things, getting intent. You know, we want to make the world a certain way and, and getting the world into that state. It turns out there's a whole branch of science around it. Um, I'm going to try and give a talk that's, I'm going to give you real examples 
places we're using this just to give you a flavor of what controlled dairy does. But my real goal is I'm going to try and give you jumping off points too, like places where you can take things and then take them on your own and maybe dig in deeper if this excites you and interests you. Um, there's lots of prior art right um, here at QCon, actually QCon in San Francisco just a few months. Months ago was a great talk uh, on controlled dairy where Valerie goes into um, a really good formal approach into, into how uh, some container scaling systems can be modeled and approached uh, in a controlled theory framework, and it's a talk well worth watching. Um, there's more math in, this talk, in that talk than there will be in my talk. Uh, so if you're really excited by calculus, um, look, look up that talk. It's a, it's a really, really good one. Uh, there's books on this subject, thankfully. Um, I've, I've read both these books. They're pretty good. Um, the feedback control book is, is very directly applicable to our, to our field, you know, if you're controlling computers and distributed systems and so on. Uh, the second book, um, Designing Distributed Control Systems, was not really written with computer systems in mind. Uh, when they talk about, you know, their distributed systems, they're actually talking about, you know, big real world machines where not everything's connected and talking to one another. As you see, there's like a logging machine on the front cover. Obviously, it's got nothing to do with like, say, running S3 uh, or a system like I work on. But it turns out it actually has a lot of patterns and a lot of lessons in it uh, that directly apply to our field. Uh, I, like, I, it's amazing how much I keep coming back to it. Um, and the places where I see control theory crop up, like directly in my job, is uh, I go to a lot of design reviews, right? I'm a principal, principal engineer at uh, AWS, so one of my jobs is a uh, team wants to build something or is in the process of building something, they'll, they'll have some design reviews and they'll invite some people and often I'm there uh, and we're looking at the system and whether it's you know, going to work and what, what we can do with it. And I do the same with customers. Uh, th there's you know sets of customers I meet pretty frequently where we're, we're talking about how they're going to you know move to the cloud. What are they building in the process? What do their systems look like? Uh, and and um, I see a lot of places where control theory is directly applicable but rarely applied. Um, auto scaling and placement are really obvious examples. We're going to walk through some. Uh, but another is like fairness algorithms. So a, a, a really common fairness algorithm is how like TCP achieves fairness. You know, you've got all these network users and you want to give them all a fair slice. Turns out there's actually, you know, that's essentially a PID loop is what's happening. And in system stability, right, how do we absorb errors, recover from those errors? Uh, and, I'll, and I'll give you some examples. So no talk, you know, focused on control theory um, would be complete without like the really, really classic example which is a furnace, right? This is like if you were learning control theory at a university, this would be the very first example anyone would pick out. And I'm not going to do anything any different. But it's, really, it's a good example because it's so easy to follow. So imagine we've got you know, a tank of water, and we've got a heat source, and we want to get the tank um, to a known temperature, right? And we can, we can vary the heat source. We can turn it up. We can turn it down. We can make it hotter. We can, uh, we can make it cooler. And, you know, how you would go about doing this is kind of obvious, right? You would measure the temperature of the water, and then if the water's too cold, you know, you turn the heat up, and if the water's too hot, you turn the heat off, or you turn the heat down if it's uh, approaching that temperature, right? Really, really simple stuff. Um, but it turns out control theory has a lot to say about how this can be done st stably. You know, there's a lot of very naive approaches, right? Like if you just have a really big fire, and you just keep it under the furnace for a long time until exactly the, you measure the right temperature, and you just remove the heat, like it'll probably start cooling down really, really quickly, right? Or you can overheat in some cases where there's lag because you know, the place you're measuring in the tank of water is maybe you know, not being convected too efficiently, and, and the rest of the water isn't at that temperature. Um, and control, control theory is the science and analysis of like, figuring out how to get this right, how to make it stable. Um, and it has a lot to say. And the biggest thing it has to say, right, is that you should approach the system in terms of measuring its error, right? So I've got a desired temperature. Like, let's say I want to get this uh, water to 100 degrees Celsius. I'm European, so someone will have to translate, um, which is boiling temperature. And uh, it starts off at room temperature, which is about 20 degrees Celsius. In that case, the error is 80 degrees Celsius. Right? And we focus on the error, like what is the distance from the desired state that we want it to get to. Um, and a really simple kind of controller is a P controller. 
that's a proportionate controller, where all we do is we take some action proportionate to the error, right? So the error is 80, so I keep the heat high. Then, the eight, then it goes to 70, 60, you know, 50. And I gradually turn down the heat as it goes. And that's a proportional controller. Really, really simple control system. Um, and you would think that would just get to the line and go really, you know, just fine. In reality, a proportional controller will tend to oscillate because there are natural lags in the system and there's no like, perfect way to measure things, uh, as we all know. So it'll just kind of hover above the line. It won't be a perfectly stable system. Um, so we, to improve on that, we don't just act in proportion to the error. Uh, we, act, we use an integral of the error too. Now that's just fancy math for saying, you know, we take the whole area under the curve of, of that error, right? So, so we take some action that's proportionate to like, how much error we've had over a, a period of time. Uh, and when you add that, you've got a PI controller, right? You've got a proportional component, you've got an integral component. That will still tend to oscillate, but far less. It'll, it'll tend to like really close to asymptote the, the line you're trying to hit, trying to get things to a target temperature. Uh, many, many real world systems are PI controllers. Uh, potentially the you know, thermostat and HVAC system in this room or cruise control in your car and so on. Um, but control theory in its really refined sense actually says, well, even a PI controller isn't perfectly stable. And the reason is if, if this system were to suffer a big shock, um, like if you know, a lot of water were to suddenly to be taken out of the tank, um, it, it won't react well. There'll be just too much uh, no, too much noise in the measuring signal and it'll, it'll overdrive or underdrive the system. And to correct for that, you need a derivative component, right? And that's where PID comes from, a proportional integral and a derivative component. And control theory actually says you can't be a completely stable system without all three. Even on the real world, there's a lot of, you know, PI controllers, they, they just, there's theoretical shocks. Um, they may not be able to absorb. Um, and if you can build a mental model of like analyzing systems through this framework, we're gonna go through a few, um, it can give you really simple insights and b you can very quickly determine that a system you know, may not be stable or, or, or safe or needs correction in some way. So this is the example of a furnace, right? Uh, it's actually pretty much the exact same graph and the exact same response for like an auto scaling system. And auto scaling is a fancy furnace. There's, there's, um, there's not much else going on. The, you know, in the case of an auto-scaling system, you know, we're measuring some target metric, right? Like say CPU utilization on a fleet, right? So let's say I've got 10 EC2 instances, and my goal is that none of them should be more than 20% you know, of CPU or something like that, which would be a typical value. It seems low, but people pick those values because they want very responsive latencies and they don't want queues building up and that, or garbage collection and all those kind of things. Um, so we, we measure its state and we see, okay, what's the CPU? If it's below, way below 20, then the system can be like, oh, you've got too many hosts. I'm gonna scale you down, just like turning the heat off, right? And then the CPU starts to rise a bit because the fleet gets a little bit more contended now that there's fewer boxes. And you can see what's gonna happen, right? Eventually it'll get small enough that the CPU will go above 20% on whatever the remaining number of hosts are, and we'll start scaling out again, right? Or, putting, or vertically or horizontally, whatever way the system has been um, tuned to scale. And uh, the, our auto-scaling system that we've built, uh, we have a, a, a direct EC2 auto-scaling system. You can use it to provision instances. Uh, this is exactly how it works. We have, also have auto-scaling systems that are built into our elastic load balancer, that are built into uh, how we provision storage, or if you're using a service like uh, DynamoDB, DynamoDB, you know, how, how many storage slices to use to give you a certain amount of IOPS and so on. This is the exact kind of control system that's going on behind the scenes. Um, now they get fancier over time, right? A simple PI controller will do a pretty good job, but it's maybe not as optimal or as efficient as something with more knowledge can be. Um, so an example, something we launched pretty recently that's part of our uh, auto scaling service is we launched support for uh, machine learning based forecasting, right? Which is kind of incredible. Uh, what what we can do is we can actually look at your metric and say, well, this is, this is the metric that you want to hit over time. You want to be this 20% and so on. We can analyze that metric using techniques like Fourier analysis, 
right, that break it down into constituent um, frequencies. So a lot of metrics that we look at, like a lot of people's daily load patterns are daily load patterns, right? Or, and, but they also have like a weekly load pattern, right? So even, so every day, you know, it's maybe busy in the evenings if it's say an entertainment service, uh, you know, people watching videos or something like that. Um, but then every week, maybe, you know, Friday night is your busiest week because that's when, or busiest of the week. And then you might have busier days or quieter days across a year because of holidays and sporting events and so on, right? And um, that's kind of analysis can find these patterns and then um, they can be forecast, right? So we can replay them into the future and see, well, what's gonna happen? Uh, and we can actually apply machine learning techniques to it now. We have inference models and so on that can figure out what they think is gonna happen next and pre-scale before they're gonna happen. And you know, this just looks like a machine learning feature, but to me, looking at this system through the lens of uh, a PID controller, it's like, well, this is just a fancy integral, right? This is like the I component of a PID controller. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look at my total history and project a little into the future, right? Integration is essentially a form of forecasting. Um, and so it still fits in my, in my PID control model and can still be analyzed in that way. And I've tested it out. I've done a few things um, along those things. Like you can you know, play with different values and see how the system responds as you would expect a PID controller to work. And it does. Um, now that's, a, that's a, a really simple, straightforward kind of application of a PID controller. Um, a less kind of simple one and less common one is, well, we can auto scale when we've got elastic capacity, right? Like, you know, we can take users wherever they are in the world and send them to their closest, best region, you know, that I'm operating in. And we can just scale elastically so that every, everybody can be serviced by their absolutely best region, right? Um, that's great when I've got elastic capacity. But when I've got fixed capacity, like we also have a CDN, Amazon CloudFront, um, and that's got fixed relatively static capacity. You know, when we build a CloudFront site, it goes in there with a certain number of machines. You know, we put some racks in a room and it's got those machines and actually the count might go slightly down over time because there's a failure rate and you know, not everything gets replaced instantaneously. Um, and, but essentially they have, they have the capacity they have. You know, I can't just, like launching an EC2 instance, I can't just go in tomorrow and add another rack. It takes a bit of planning and uh, there's a whole procedure for that and so on. And so um, you might think this is somewhere where, you know, figuring out which site can take which users, well, how could a PID controller help there? One way is, well, we, we know one easy way to do a system here would be, okay, figure out what the capacity of each site is, figure out your peak time of every single day, okay? And then make sure that at that peak time, no site would be overwhelmed, you know, only allocate each site uh, enough users, enough of like the close users um, that you're not gonna overwhelm each site. Uh, but that's very inefficient, right? Because then at night when um, things are a bit less busy, well, there's lots of users who might be slightly better serviced by a site, but they're going to maybe their second or their third best site, um, which uh, is just not optimal. Uh, and actually ends up just because of the way, you know, time zones work and people having different periods of activity across the world uh, leads to suboptimal packing. So something we do um, in CloudFront is that we actually run a control system. We're constantly measuring um, the utilization of each site. And depending on that utilization, like we figure out well, what's our error? How far are we from optimized? And we change the kind of like mass or radius of effect of each site, right? So that at a really busy time of day, like really close to peak, it's servicing, you know, everybody in that city, everybody directly around it, drawing those in. But that at a quieter time of day, it can extend a little further and, and go out. And, that's an ex and it's like a big system of dynamic springs all interconnected and so on, uh, all with PID loops. And it's um, um, amazing. Uh, how optimal a system like that can be and how applying a system like that has actually increased our uh, effectiveness as a CDM provider. You know, we now provide stream um, quite a lot of video uh, that people are watching at home. Uh, a pretty high percentage of it is, is hosted on CloudFront these days. Um, and I think a lot of that's due directly in part 
to that um, to that control system. So um, these are you know straightforward examples of where we've applied PID loops. I'm going to go through some more, but like I said, I wanted to give us more of a mental model and some jumping off points and ways um, of utilizing PID theory kind of more directly in uh, in our in our daily lives and our daily jobs. Um, and so when I gave this talk back in November, um, I said that if you, if you go to the effort of really understanding control theory, it can be like a superpower, right? It can really help you um, deep dive into these systems. And the superpower I think it is, is it's most like is x-ray vision, because you, you can really nail some, um, some things. And so the first of five kind of patterns that I'm just going to go through into what I see as like common anti-patterns or common lessons from control theory that I see us miss in real world designs. Um, and the first is open loops. Uh, and it's, um, it's very natural when you're building a control system, right? When, you, when you've got, you, something needs to do something, right? I've got to get a config onto 10 boxes. I've got to launch 10 instances, you know? It's very natural to, to have a script or write a system that just does those things in that order, right? Um, we've probably all seen scripts like this. Uh, at small scale, they work fine. And um, if you're doing things manually, you know, this, is what, this is how we do manual actions and so on as well. But systems like this um, are an open loop, right? They're just doing actions and nothing's really checking if those actions occur. And, um, you know, we've gotten really good at building reliable infrastructure, and in some ways, too good. Like, it works so reliably, you just do it time after time after time, you never really notice, well, what if it failed one day? Something's gonna go wrong, right? And that can kind of creep into systems uh, in very, very dangerous ways. And a surprising number of control systems are just like this. They're just open loops. Um, you know, I can't count the number of customers I've gone through control systems with, and they told me, um, well, we have this system that pushes out some states and some, some configuration and so on, and sometimes it doesn't do it. Like, and they don't really know why, but they have built this other button that they press that basically starts everything all over and it gets there the next time. And in some cases, they even have their support personnel, you know, at the end of a phone line, that's what they do. You know, they get a complaint from one of their customers saying, you know, I, I took an action, I set a setting, and it didn't happen. And they have this magic button that's just, they press it and it syncs all the config out again and it's fixed. Um, and it's, it, I find that kind of scary because it, what it's saying is nothing's actually monitoring the system. Nothing's really checking that everything is as it should be. And, and al already every day they're getting this kind of, you know, creep from, from what the state should be. And if they ever had a really big problem, like a big shock in the system, it clearly wouldn't be able to self-repair um, healthily, which is, uh, which, is not, which is not what you want. Um, another common reason for open loops is when actions are just infrequent. Right? If it's an action that you're not taking really, really often, odds are it's just an open loop. It's relying on people to fix things, not the system itself. Um, there's two kind of complementary uh, tools in the chest that we all have these days that really help combat open loops. Um, the first is chaos engineering. Right? If you actually deliberately go break things a lot, that tends to find a lot of open loops and make it obvious that they have to be fixed. Um, it drives me crazy a little because I find that, you know, you can probably just think through a lot of the things chaos engineering will find, um, and, and that can be quicker. Uh, and then the other is observability, right? That really what this problem space demands is, look, we gotta be monitoring things. Uh, we really gotta be keeping an eye on it. Um, we have two um, observability systems at AWS, CloudWatch and X-Ray, and uh, one of the things I didn't appreciate until I joined AWS, you know, it was a bit, bit like kind of going, going on um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and seeing the insides. I expected to see all sorts of cool algorithms and all sorts of fancy techniques uh, and things that I just never imagined. And it was kind of a little bit of that, like there was some of that once I, once I got inside working, but mostly what I found was m really mundane, the, the people were just doing a lot of things at scale that I didn't realize. And one of those things was just the sheer volume of monitoring, like the number of metrics we keep on you know, every single host, every single system, uh, I still find staggering. Like we've, we've made 
collecting those metrics extremely cheap and then we collect them as much as possible. And that helps us close all these loops, right? That helps us build systems where you know, we can detect drift and we can make sure they're, in, uh, they're heading for stable states and not heading for, for unstable states. Um, uh, we try to avoid infrequent actions, right? If, if we have a process that's happening once a year, it's almost certainly doomed to failure, right? If it's happening once a day, it's probably okay. Um, my classic favorite example of this uh, as an open loop process um, is certificate rotation, right? So I, like, I, I happen to work on TLS a lot. It's, it's something I spend a lot of my time on. And not a week goes by without some major website having a certificate outage, right? And often it's because they got like a, a three-year or a one-year certificate and they put it on their boxes. They're like, okay, well, I don't have to think about it for another year or three. And then the person leaves and there's nothing really monitoring it. Nobody's getting an email. And then, you know, that day comes and the certificate isn't valid anymore and we're in trouble. A really, really common uh, open loop is just credential management in general, of which this is just one example. Um, at AWS, we built, a, you know, we have this problem too, right? We have to keep a lot of certificates uh, in sync. So we built our own certificate management system and we actually made it public. Um, we use this ourselves. It's uh, tied into ELB and CloudFront and a bunch of things. Um, but having that system with a closed loop. So Amazon Certificate Manager is actually monitoring certificates as well, looking for any drift, making sure that the low balancers that should have things really have them, that a CloudFront distribution that should have it really has it and so on. Um, and uh, it's even possible to like monitor and alert and so on on, on certificate expiry times uh, if you've loaded them in manually. Um, so the, the magic to fixing these open loops is to really think about measuring first, right? Like I said with that earliest example about just taking feedback and integrating that, but um, approaching systems design as, okay, I'm not gonna write a script or a control system that just does X, then Y, then Z. Instead, I'm gonna approach it as, I'm gonna describe my desired state, so it's a bit more declarative, and then you're gonna write a system that kind of drives everything to that desired state. Those are very different shapes of systems, right? Like you, you'll just write your code very differently when you've got that mental model. Um, and in my experience, that model is, is far better. Um, far better because it is a closed loop from day one. Uh, far better because they tend to be smaller, s more succinct ways to just describe these systems. Far better because it can also be dual purpose. Like, Often your provisioning system can be the same as a control system. Like for example, you know, you show up on day one and you've got a new uh, region to build in our case or availability zone to build or something like that. Again, in our case, you know, you can just run your control plane and it starts off and the error is, I don't have any of my hosts. So provision them, right? It's because that's what it's meant to do. That's what it's built to do. Uh, and it ends up having a dual role, which is kind of cool. If you're into formal verification like I am, uh, it is vastly easier, you know, when you get to the stage where you can formally verify something, to, to verify declarative systems, systems that have their state described like that. It's just easier. The tools are more structured that way. Um, we've been doing a bunch of this. Uh, we've, we've got papers out where we've um, shown how we use TLA Plus and SAW and Cryptol, and you can, you can search for those if you're interested. Um, but we also use tools like FSTAR and um, Coke and so on, uh, which are uh, pretty awesome. And, and useful for verifying these kinds of systems. But anyway, that's the first X-ray vision superpower. Look for open loops. Um, so the second is about power laws, right? And it's about looking for power laws and systems and how to fight them. And, uh, and the reason for this is to do with another um, mental model that I have, which is around how errors um, propagate. So like, imagine your distributed system, in my case, the cloud right, as just this one big uniform collection of boxes. And these boxes might represent hosts or applications or processes or however granular you want. These could be, you know, every tiny little bit of memory on every device in your entire system, right? And someday an error happens somewhere that you didn't really plan for, right? An exception is thrown, 
a box chokes up, a piece of hardware fails, like whatever, right? Well, in distributed systems, that box has dependencies, right? And they tend to fail then too, especially if they're synchronous systems, right? Um, so now these other things that we're talking to it are failing in unpredictable ways. And that spreads. And like any network effect, right, when things are interconnected, they tend to exhibit power laws in how they spread, right, because things just exponentially increase at each, at each layer. And that's kind of what we're fighting in system stability, right, that's the problem, and it's a really tough one. Um, you know, our primary mechanism for fighting this at Amazon Web Services is we compartmentalize, right? We just don't let ourselves have really, really big systems. We instead try to have cellular systems like our availability zones and regions that are like really strongly isolated so that errors we can't even think about just won't spread. Um, and that's been working pretty well for us. And also as a lesson from control theory, a lot of the literature on control theory talks about, you know, if you've got a critical system, dividing it up into compartments and controlling them independently um, at the cost of maybe some optimality tends to be, tends to be worth it. A good example there is, uh, you know, nuclear power plants. You know, typically each reactor is controlled independently, right? Because the risk of having one control system for all of them just isn't worth it. Um, so that, um, that helps. But you know, you, that, still, that still means you could have an error that propagates to, to infect the whole compartment. Um, but we want to be able to fight that. So we need our own power laws that can fight back, you know, things that can push in the other direction. And these are like those integral and derivative components. Right? These are things that can drive the system into the state we want. Um, exponential back off, right? really strong example. So exponential back off is basically an integral. Right? We're, uh, you know, an error happens and we retry, you know, maybe a second later, if that fails, well then we wait, you know, an exponentially increasing amount of time, three seconds, then 10 seconds, then 100 seconds, right? It's clearly exponential and it's clearly acting, acting based on the total history. And, um, and that really helps. In fact, it's the only way to drive an overloaded system back to stability is with some kind of exponential back off. Um, uh, very, very powerful. Uh, rate limiters, they're kind of like derivatives, right? They're just rate estimators and what's going on and deciding um, what's to let in and uh, what to let out. And we've built both of these actually into the AWS SDKs, right? So like if you're using the S3 client or the DynamoDB client, um, these are built in. And we've really finely tuned these things. You know, we've tuned them so that they've got the appropriate amounts of jitter, they've got the appropriate amounts of uh, back off, and then we also rate limit the retries themselves. So that we don't get crazy distributed uh, retry storms that can take down um, entire systems. And we've really focused to make the back pressure uh, as efficient and effective as, as, um, as we think it needs to be. This is not uh, an easy problem. And there's a whole science in control theory called loop tuning, right? About getting all these little parameters uh, perfectly optimal. And I think there's about four or five years of history now gone into the AWS SDKs um, on, on just how we're trying to get this right and we're uh, constantly trying to improve it. Um, but, it's, but it's pretty cool and, and worth copying. <laughs> um, we've got other back pressure strategies too. You know, we've got systems where servers can tell clients, you know, back off please, I'm a little busy right now. Uh, all those kind of things working together. But if, if I look at a system design and it doesn't have any of this, if it doesn't have exponential back off, if it doesn't have rate limiters, in some place, if it's not able to fight some power law that I think might arise due to errors propagating, um, that tells me you know, I, need to, uh, I need to be a bit more worried and start digging deeper. Um, there's a, also a great paper, um, or a blog post, I should say, by Mark Brooker, my colleague, which you can search for, uh, where he goes into some really fine grained detail about how the stuff we put into the SDKs actually works. So that's the second of five patterns. Um, the third is about liveness and lag. So pretty much any control system is doomed to failure if it's operating on old information, right? And old information can be even worse than no information, right? Like if we were you know, controlling the temperature in this room based on the, the temperature you know, 30 minutes ago, that's just not gonna work because there weren't so many people in the room at that time and the information's just false and it's, um, it's gonna heat it up too much. It's no, no good. Um, but this can crop up a lot. And the reason this can crop up a lot in distributed systems is we often use workflows to do things, right? 
And workflows can start just taking variable amounts of time. You know, as the workflow grows and we put more work in it, it can just start taking longer to do things. Uh, and also reporting back metrics, like getting information back, can also become laggy, especially when you've got a really busy day or a really chaotic event, lots of stuff going on. Um, and that can result in, you know, ephemeral shocks to the system, you know, like huge spikes in load or a, ma or a dec sudden decrease in capacity can become unrecoverable, right? Because the system just becomes overwhelmed and then the lag starts driving the system and it can never really get back uh, into the state it wants to be. The, um, the underlying reason for a lot of this um, is because we, we use FIFOs for most things. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, the kind of bulletproof fix for these systems um, is impractical and very expensive, but it's to do everything everywhere in constant time, right? So uh, a simple example of that is, um, let's say I've got a configuration file and it's got some user parameters in it that they can set, right? And one way to build that system is, okay, user sets parameter, well, just push that little diff or delta out to the system. Works great. Right, until lots of users change their settings at the same time if you've got some kind of correlated condition. Now the system gets super laggy. Right? A different way to build it would be, well, just push all the state every time. You know? Especially if it's not too big, that can be practical. Um, but it gets expensive for, for really big systems. Um, the same for measuring things. Measure everything all the time. Well, we're a little bit better about that. That tends to be how monitoring systems work. Um, we have some systems at AWS, like our most critical systems, where we've built this pattern in. So our systems for doing um, DNS health checks, uh, networking health checks and so on, they're so critical to availability. They have to work, even during the most critical events, even during when there's total chaos. Um, they absolutely have to work. So we've built those as completely constant time systems. You know, when you set up a Route 53 health check, that's like pinging your website to see if it's healthy or not, and should your traffic load go to you know, this uh, web server in this zone or this web server in this other zone, that's happening at the same rate all the time, and the information about it's being relayed back all the time. It's healthy or unhealthy, healthy or unhealthy. Not, oh, it went from healthy to unhealthy, so, so only send that delta back. Uh, and that makes it really, really robust and reliable. Um, if you, if you do need a queue or a workflow, think really, really carefully about how deep that should be allowed to grow. You know, in general, we want to keep them really short. If they get too long, like, it's best to return errors. We've, I mean, that, um, it's a lesson I've heard restated from so many different places that I think it's um, an extremely deep one. And that for information channels, if you're relaying back metrics and so on, LIFO, uh, is commonly overlooked, and it's a really great strategy. A LIFO queue does exactly what we want here. It'll always prioritize liveness. It'll always give you the most recent information, and it'll backfill you know, when it has some capacity, any previous information. It's like the best of both worlds. But it's rarely seen. You rarely see LIFOs uh, in information systems. Um, so ours are, but um, I don't know why it's more, not more common. Uh, so my fourth pattern, and a really uh, short and simple one, is to look for false functions. So the thing you're measuring, you want it to be like a real function. You want it to be um, something that like, moves in a predictable way that is something you're actually trying to control. And it's really common for uh, there to be many dimensions of utilization in a distributed system. So a really simple example, right? Let's say we've got a a web server, and it's taking requests. Well, as load goes up, you know, CPU goes up at a certain rate because of like SSL handshakes and whatnot. Memory consumption goes up at a certain rate because of, uh, you know, overloads. And maybe I've got a caching system, and my cache utilization goes up uh, at a different rate. All different rates, right? They all have their own kind of functions. But um, what can happen is that someone, you know, we we don't always perceive that these are different things, and we instead measure some synthetic variable that's a fake function um, of all three, right? It's like looking at the max of all three, uh, and that doesn't work. It turns out not to be predictable. You haven't really dimensionalized the system. This all is a really complicated 
um, process control theory way to say uh, that the Unix load metric is evil. Um, and, and will bite you. And the, like, if, because the Unix load metric or network latency or queue depth metrics in general, so Unix load is a queue depth metric, is the compound of so many other things that are going on that it doesn't really behave in a linear way. There's, you got to get at the underlying variables. And so a lot of systems that are built just on measuring load tend to be chaotic and not really be able to correctly control. Uh, and we found that um, it's best to actually measure some of the underlying things. CPU turns out to be surprising reli surprisingly reliable. It's surprising to me because I spend a lot of time working on low-level CPU architecture, and I know how complicated CPU pipelines are. But it turns out at the macro level, just measuring uh, CPU percentage can be very effective. And then my last pattern is about edge triggering, right? And so what edge triggering is, is um, you know, you've got a system, like we're heating our furnace, right? And it gets, and let's say we just keep the heat on and it gets all the way to the target temperature. And then once it gets to the target temperature, we cross the heat off, right? We turn the heat off. That is an edge triggered system. We triggered at the edge, right? And only at the edge. Um, and there's a lot of control theory and a lot of debate about edge, edge triggered systems versus level triggered systems. Um, they can even be modeled in terms of, it, in, in terms of one another. But I like to really watch out for edge triggering in systems. It tends to be an anti-pattern. Uh, one reason is because edge triggering seems to imply a modal behavior. You know, you cross a line, you kick into a new mode. That mode is probably rarely tested. Uh, and it's now being kicked into at a time of high stress. That's really dangerous, right? Another is that edge triggering, when you think about it, kind of needs us to solve to deliver exactly one's problem, which nobody has solved or ever will solve. Right? Because what if you miss that message? You know, what if your system is, well, I just send an alarm when I cross the line. Well, what if that gets dropped? Well, now I've got to retry it. Well, no, your system has to be idempotent. And if you're going to build an idempotent system, you might as well make a level-triggered system in the first place, because the, generally the only benefit of building an edge-triggered system is it doesn't have to be idempotent. So I like to see edge-triggering only from humans. You know, if I'm actually alerting a human, actually sending them a page or something like that. But for control systems, it's, it's usually an anti-pattern. It's better instead to be measuring that level, like we said. That gets us to the end of all my patterns. Um, the biggest one is to look for the system being measured. Honestly, you'll be surprised how many times you will just notice that the system isn't really being measured or observed. And that's enough to really improve the stability um, by a lot. And if you learn and look into all these techniques, they're really highly leveraged. Like I said, the fruit's touching the ground. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming to my talk. It's been a, a pleasure and a privilege. Uh, I did want to save one bad joke f for the very end, which is that this is going on my resume as I performed on Broadway. So I hope. <laughs> um, thank you. barely see, so if there are questions, I'm going to have to hear them. Yeah, the only question I have is, because we have used machine learning for the first four patterns, why can we not use that in the edge triggering system to lower the edge just before the high stress point? Uh, and that becomes a pattern again. Why is it an anti-pattern then? Oh. <laughs> um, so your question, you're asking, well, um, if, we, if we just give ourselves some margin of error, if we put the line even a little bit lower, uh, wouldn't that improve safety? You can absolutely do that. Um, but in high shock or high stress situations, you'll never guarantee that there isn't too much lag between those things that you just don't have time to correct. And an another is, um, there's an entire area of control theory designed around exactly what you're talking about, which is called hysteresis, which is um, just almost exactly that property. Uh, and you can totally do it. It, it just gets really complicated really quickly. Um, and level triggering tends to be um, far simpler. Far simpler. OK, thank you. But y your intuition is right, though. It can be done. Yeah. Other questions? 
Oh, it's one more. So you, you mentioned three variables, P, I, I, and D. So can you give an example of a system that, uh, just simple example of a system that will not recover from a stress? Um, a system that will no longer recover from stress? No, just, I, I missed this part. I don't understand what does it mean. So the system is, let's say, auto-scaling scenario. Yeah. Uh, can you give an example of a stressful scenario where a similar system would not recover? Yeah, so if we merely had a P controller, for example, for auto-scaling, and we suddenly lost half the capacity, right? Like just half the servers died. Um, what would happen is the error would go up so quickly on the remaining hosts that a P controller would, would what, you know, way overscale the system. Um, and then load would go down so much, right? Um, because there were so many more hosts. So then it would scale it back in again and it would just oscillate like that for quite a while. And that's what we mean by instability in the context of a control system. Thank you. Great. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, it's a really good insight. And uh, my question is about, uh, well, we actually quite often have uh, this situation, uh, which was just asked when we have a relatively stable load and then a sudden spike, and uh, w which we can't actually predict. And uh, my question will be then, what would be the direction to look into maybe in these control systems how to properly respond? So usually the problem is that the response time is like too slow, we can't scale that fast, and we need to know uh, before that, and it's not that predictable. Yeah, thanks. I, so I don't have an answer, and I don't have, we have not yet built precognition, um, <laughs> which I would love. I mean, our main focus for that at AWS has been to build systems that are just inherently, you know, more capacity. So for example, one of the differences between application load balancer, our main like layer seven load balancer, and our network load balancer is our network load balancers um, are scaled to like five gigabits per second minimum, millions of connections per second, you know, can do terabits ultimately. And we barely even need to control them, right? Just because the headroom is so high and that's how we're trying to fix that. And then meanwhile, for other systems, well, we just have to react and scale as quickly as possible. And we've been trying to get our launch times down as low as low as possible. And we can, we can now scale and launch EC2 instances in seconds, which, which helps. But there's, there's no other fix for that. There's nothing we can do in a controller that can magic away the unpredictable. <laughs> Seems like there's one back here. Hi. Hi. Uh, you talked about uh, like back off, retry, um, all, all that stuff being really important. Uh, what sort of uh, process, frameworks, tools do you have it uh, to have to make it really easy for teams to do that? Sure. So um, at AWS, we we try to bake those into our um, like request libraries directly. So we have an internal library system called Carl, which we build all of our uh, clients and servers on, and we just make it the defaults. It's in there. And then for our customers uh, and ourselves, because we use the SDKs as well, we've, we've got our SDKs and we bake it all in there. And the SDK team that maintains all that, you know, they think a lot about this stuff. So we just try to make it the default that comes out of the box and not have to, um, have to educate customers or expect anybody to do anything different than the default. And that's been very successful. Yeah, thanks for the talk. And in contrast theory, the most uh, 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 gain that we can get is to actually move the control points to as close as to the pole, right? I think it's uh, in the uh, uh, resource management, it's not the case. So that, what do you think? And any any, it would be great to have insight of uh, where we actually take the point in between the uh, stability versus the performance. I'm not. I'm not sure I've heard all the questions. Sorry. From the from the given resources that we can get like an X amount of uh, 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 like for example like computation resources from there, right? But uh, in when we actually reach uh, pursuing the uh, more and more stable system, then we tend to actually lose the uh, maximum capacity that we can expand, oh, sure. right? 
Yeah, so there is definitely tension between stability and optimality. And, um, it, you know, in general, the more finely tuned you want to make a system to achieve absolute optimality, the more risk you are at being able to drive it into an unstable state. There, is, there are people who do entire PhDs on nothing else than like finding that balance for one system. Like, you know, oil, oil refineries are a good example where the oil industry will pay people a lot of money just to optimize that even very slightly. Computer science, in my opinion, and distributed systems are nowhere near that level of um, advanced control theory practice yet. Um, we've a long way to go. We're still down at the baby steps of, well, at least measure it. Thank you. <laughs>